Good afternoon to everyone joining us from Gulf and a very good morning and good evening to our international audience joining from across the globe for the fourth installment of the RIBA Gulf Life Lunch Talks. I'm Azlina Bulma, RIBA Director of International. Since the opening of our Gulf office in Sharjah in the UAE in 2019, we have been working to support and showcase design excellence across the GCC and Jordan. I'm pleased to have our IBA members joining us from the region today and also from further afield, including the UK, China and Malaysia, just to name a few. The Gulf Life Lunch Talks are designed to share and expand knowledge on projects and ideas from across the region and promote interactive conversations with leading architects, no matter where one may be. Today's session is special. We are celebrating Peter Jackson's appointment to the 2021 RIBA Fellow membership, as well as his 50 years as an RIBA member this year. We will start today's session with a brief interview with Peter to learn about his interesting career, post which Peter will present his thoughts and views on architecture in Sharjah. We would like today's session to be interactive. So as always, if you have any thoughts or questions for our speaker, then please send them in at any time during the session in the chat bar alongside, and we will get to them in the last 10 to 15 minutes. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Peter Jackson, FRIBA, Architect Advisor in his uh, HHA Rulers Office of Sharjah, who is joining us from Sharjah today. Welcome, Peter. Now, Thank you. you and I have known each other for quite some time uh, and I very much have learned so much about Sharjah and Gulf from you. I also know that you've been in Gulf for some years and have uh, seen some significant changes. So I think it'd be really interesting for our viewers to learn a little bit about your early years as an architect, including the many years in Gulf. So my first question, therefore, is what brought you into du Dubai in 1972 and what were some of your early impressions of Dubai? I was a student at the Bartlett. I was in my, the first, I had just was completing my first half of my practical training after my degree. And I was getting very frustrated and disappointed by the work I was doing. I was really beginning to question whether I wanted to go on and be an architect. And uh, my parents were in the Gulf. My father was an engineer, civil engineer in Dubai. Um, so I decided at the, um, at the midpoint of the uh, field experience year to come out to Dubai and join them. Um, particularly as my father knew an architect here um, who was very keen to get some assistance. Uh, capital Tony Lodge and he was the partner of John R. Harris here in Dubai, and they were building the Rashid Hospital at the time. So I arrived a month after the UAE became the United Arab Emirates, um, exactly a month. I think I arrived around the 2nd of January, 72, and I had basically what should have been a holiday or could have been a holiday, but I finished up working really hard for Tony for about six weeks and regained all my enthusiasm for architecture. And I looked after all the small jobs um, that he didn't have time for because there were very few architects in Dubai at that time, very, very few. Um, and we had, uh, John Harris had clients with the National Bank of Dubai. And uh, remember there was a church porch, there was a, uh, uh, a villa in Shiraz, um, all sorts of, uh, you know, all sorts of jobs needing to be done. Um, and I was able to assist Tony and also experience a completely different culture. The excitement of being in a new country, there was, you know, it was a almost, it was a big experiment. You know, at the time, there was a suspicions that, you know, the United Arab Emirates wouldn't necessarily hold together, which of course it did. Um, the, the weekends, which in those days was just a day, if you were lucky, you could get a Thursday afternoon off and, and and a Friday, uh, Friday wasn't a full weekend as we know it now. Um, used to go out to the desert, go up to the uh, palm gardens at Ras Al Khaimah. And there was very, very little development. Dubai was only 70,000 people. And um, it, was very, it was a very bustling and very beautiful little town, Dubai. You can hardly call it a city. Uh, used to have to cross the creek by the one bridge one lane in each direction, I think it was, 
uh, but you're crossed on Abra, standing up, and uh, the smells of the souk, the 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 uh, the colour, um, it was fantastic. Uh, I was really stimulated. I, 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 I liked it a lot. Um, and of course, the architecture, the wind tower architecture of the Bustakia, uh, the Arish, the palm architecture, um, there was still a lot of it around in those days. So altogether, I was, um, you know, I, I left reinvigorated and enthusiasm for architecture. Um, the last evening I was there, I met John Harris himself, um, and I I would then come back a year later, at the end of the year, for a second trip. And then I actually did quite a lot of research so that I could do a diploma project on a low cost housing scheme, which was way out in the desert in those days, but now is right in the center of Dubai, of greater Dubai. And um, it was, uh, it gave, that introduced me. I met Sheikh Rashid um, briefly, that was a privilege. I met uh, his senior advisors in water and, and finance, and I was able to get, sort of build up some sort of picture as a context for the, uh, the architectural project that would follow. Um, and also that what came out of that was uh, really question, I, I questioned a lot about the nature of what is architecture, particularly doing low cost housing. Um, and I was lucky enough to have Walter Siegel as my project tutor. Of course, he did a lot of self-build housing, and but I was also introduced um, to Cho Padamzer, the Development and Planning Unit, which was then part of the Architectural Association. And he, he between him and someone else I was introduced to, um, Anne Coles, Dr. Anne Coles, who was at the School of Hygiene and Tropical Med Medicine at St. Pancras, uh, and they really made me question you know, are architectural solutions the right way to treat all these problems? So it was a really exciting and invigorating part of my life. Yeah. It, it does sound very, very exciting indeed. Uh, and I can't actually imagine Dubai as a town, but it sounds rather marvellous at the time. Um, and you, you talked about your time working with John R. Harris, architect, who's largely responsible for laying the foundation of modern Dubai with his first urban plan in 1960. Could you elaborate on how you began working with them and what projects you were involved with? Yeah, um, well, working with Tony, uh, Tony Lodge, um, I was looking after these rather these small projects. There were two two bank branches for the uh, uh, National Bank of Dubai, uh, one of which was in Abu Dhabi, which I never saw, so I just did the drawings, and the other one I supervised on site. I remember we had an Iranian contractor um, who had his own idea of what the building should look like, which hadn't got a great deal to do with the drawings that I was producing. So that was quite an interesting learning experience. I was very lucky to meet John Harris the night before I left my first trip. Um, he was visiting Dubai and Tony made a point to introduce me to to uh, Mr. Harris as he was. He was always Mr. Harris to his staff. And I was offered a job as soon as I you know, finished at, uh, at the Bartlett, um, which was I so I never had to look for a job. I, I, I finished and joined John Harris um, as soon as I had my diploma in architecture. Um, the work that I did um, with him, a lot of it was, wasn't very exciting work for me. There were, there were military projects in Oman, um, I, but I did, I came out, he sent me out to do an air training school in Muscat. I spent three months working in a porter cabin on a site in Seab. And uh, that was interesting when Seab was a long way from Muscat in those days. Uh, he also asked me to do a concept design for a big commercial project, which we didn't get. So that wasn't a great success, but that, that was, it was a nice responsibility. And one of the great responsibilities he gave me was to look after the Dubai office for a month. And please remember, I wasn't qualified at this time. I was still uh, doing my RIBA part three. And I came out to look after the John Harris office just when it moved out of the Rashid Hospital site and into its own uh, apartment overlooking the Dera Creek. On the, uh, um, and so I physically we moved the office and then I had to look after it for a month. Um, and he was confident that I could do that because he also knew my father was here and that if I had any immediate problems, you know, I had someone to turn to. Um, and 
The other thing that um, was, and it was during that period that I did the survey of the Wind Tower House um, on, a, on a letter of introduction that Anne Coles gave me to a family. Um, and so I did a physical survey of a Wind Tower House and John Harris was very supportive of that. He gave, he, he financially supported the publication uh, of the uh, a Wind Tower House in the Dubai's Bastakia in 1975. So, yeah, I, I, and I'm sure I would have had a nice career with John Harris if I if I had stayed. Um, and I always kept in touch with him up until shortly before he died. Yeah, it does sound that you had a yeah, marvellous time with John Harris Architects uh, and much was achieved during the time. Um, and of course, you just touch upon if you had stayed, what some of our audience may not realise is that you then went on to work in Africa for 25 years, initially in Zambia, then settling in Zimbabwe with projects in Mozambique and Botswana. In Harare, the capital of Zimbabwe, you jointly established your own practice with much of the early work tending uh, to the development, lending to development of needs of rural areas. Could you tell us about some of those projects? Yes, um, I was really conscious that I I wanted to strengthen my design skills and I was put in touch with an architect in Lusaka called Ron Kirby of Montgomery Oldfield Kirby and they had a really good reputation in uh, central southern Africa. Uh, they had an office in, in uh, Salisbury, Rhodesia then, uh, an office in Malawi and, and the Lusaka office. I met Ron Kirby in London first, crazy passionate designer, um, he became a great mentor in my life, um, right up until his death some 18 months ago. Um, he was, uh, his office was full of young uh, British architects and uh, he would bring out uh, his partner, Nick Montgomery, called us Ron's boys. Um, social life focused around the Saka Theatre Club. And in Zambia, we had I had two main projects, was the intercity bus terminus in Lusaka, which was the job that actually got me out there to, to design that and draw and build that, get that built, which it was finished when I left in 1980. And the second one was a student hostel at the Evelyn Home College. And the office, we were very conscious that this might be, it was a World Bank funded, and we were very conscious this might, might be the last some major input into the college for some time with the economy collapsing. Uh, this is in the late 70s. Um, Ron did sketches um, and, I, I th and then he won a competition for a life sciences building in, at Witz in, in uh, Witz University. So he went to, uh, he moved to Johannesburg and I finished the building off. Um, and it's very interesting. I went back to it about five years ago with Ron and and uh, one of my partners and it was really interesting to go back and see it and it stood up it stood the test of time it had been painted which it wasn't meant to be um but it was robust it was rugged it was designed with a m very few available materials in zambia at that time but we had a good artisan masonry skills no carpentry skills to speak of um and the building uh which was, I can't remember how many students it was designed for, 150 students, had a population of about three or 400 by the time we, when we go, went back. So it was serving its purpose several times over. In other words, they were shift, doing shifts to, to use the rooms. Um, but out of that experience of working, learning that design is not about fancy materials, design is about really maximizing resources to their uh, available resources, it was all about sustainability um, before there was before we used the term in architecture. Um, using using the, the skills that are available, using the materials that are available, and using colour and using space, um, not just applying fancy decoration to the facade. Using decoration in a in a creative way and a meaningful way. And these are the, this is, as I say, all learned from Ron Kirby. And then when I started with uh, Rob Adams a practice in uh, Harare in 1980, chance to go on my own at the, on the birth, uh, birth of another country, Zimbabwe. Um, Mugabe had just uh, come into power 
it was uh, a very exciting time again. And there was a big focus on training schools. You know, there'd been a freedom, uh, a freedom war. A lot of people had missed, lost their schooling to go and fight you know, for independence. And so they needed to learn skills. So we did a lot, we converted farms, um, built low cost precast concrete uh, training facilities. There was a, a huge demand for that. And included in that, we managed to get a job with local government for building um, some 50 growth centers across the country. Um, thatched markets, uh, flat roof markets. Um, we designed these on a modular basis um, with bus shelters and, and toilets, and we interfaced with these councils. And knowing that the councils would build them themselves, so we, used, we did, they weren't being built by conventional contracting, they were built by direct labor, where the, the council would employ the labor and purchase the materials themselves. So there was a lot of learning and including doing our drawings so that they could be used by very unsophisticated builders. Um, yeah, there's, so yeah, it was a very important, a very important part of our practice. Um, and it obviously didn't, that wasn't going to make us uh, uh, big architects, but it was very complementary to the commercial work that we were able to do as well. And that the, the two the two sides of the practice sort of balanced out. But Peter, we also have done so much for the architecture world because uh, you do you work on various architecture serving groups, including the RIBA Gulf chapter, English speaking branch of UAE Architecture Heritage Society and the Architects Council of Zimbabwe, the statutory body, uh, which is ARP uh, equivalent. Could you talk us through some of the work you were doing with these groups and its importance, particularly during your Zimbabwe years? I started getting involved. Ron, Ron got me involved immediately in the Zambia Institute of Architects and I was sort of editing a magazine and finished up chairing the Board of Education and uh, selecting students for training places. Um, and in fact, then Cho Padamze came into it again because he was taking our students when he was in charge of Hull School. Um, and then I even for, uh, for my last year, I was vice president of the Institute. But then came the opportunity to start the practice in Harare. Um, and there we had a white dominated um, architectural establishment in a young black country. And the profession it was going to have to adapt and change, um, which not all the members were very comfortable with. So I tried to take a lead, particularly with the Registration Council. There was an Architects Act in place. So architect, the, the, the title of architect, the fees of an architect were all protected, um, very much like Britain, say in the 50s, early 60s, um, on which it was modelled. Um, so these, this had to be modified. Also, it was focused on the Commonwealth, whereas most of the young black architects were being trained in places like China and Russia and Eastern Europe. And they were coming back and obviously weren't going to be kept out of the profession because it was uh, UK or Commonwealth orientated. So we, we needed to adapt the professional practice exams and start and, and, and give them courses to harmonize their, their qualifications um, with local conditions in Zimbabwe. Um, I was also, I, so I, I was very much part of that. And then I, I also had this great passion for historic buildings, which I still do. And I was appointed historic buildings advisor to the city of Harare and chaired a regional historic buildings advisory committee for the National Museums and Monuments. And I can't remember whether that followed my becoming being an expert witness for the city of Harare in a, in a, a court case, administrative court case, where the Reserve Bank was trying to demolish an important Victorian building. Um, we won the case, but the building eventually was destroyed. So there were important lessons to be learned. And I realized I also had to hone my my skills and not just be enthusiastic about historic buildings, but I had to know what I was talking about. So I did a lot of research and, and with, with a lot of assistance from from friends and colleagues in with same similar interests and put together a book, Historic Buildings of Harare in uh, 1986. Um, it was basically a sort of a register of historic buildings. Thank um, you. 
That's marvellous. And I, I also know you're a great author and a passionate one too. I've seen your collection of books. And, and throughout your career, you've written a number of books, such as the Historic Buildings of Harare. You've mentioned about your passion there. And you've co-authored Wind Tower, which I'm lucky enough to have a copy of. Uh, could you elaborate on the inception of this research and years of work that went into creating the book Wind Tower in particular? Well, Wind Tower was, uh, it was published as a little, um, as a pamphlet or a paper by Art and Archaeological Research Papers, Anne's and my research that I, I referred to earlier, and as a, ge a social geographer. So our skills were complementary. I was bringing architectural skills and looking at the building, and she was fleshing it out with the stories of the families. Um, when I, uh, it took a year to do this, the, to do the drawings, um, and only some of them were published in this pamphlet. When I came back to Dubai in 2002, um, uh, sadly leaving Zimbabwe behind but in a, a state of uh, economic collapse, um, I wasn't very happy at doing so, but I, you know, and I'm later on in my career, I was wondering what I, what I should do. So I came to Dubai, back to Dubai to see how it was. Um, I met the chap who was uh, running the historic buildings uh, d department in Dubai Municipality, uh, a very interesting man called Rashad Bukash. When we met at a seminar at the American University in Sharjah, I had some drawings and I wanted to show them and said, look, maybe these are of use or of interest to you. But before I could show them to him, he looked at me and he said, Peter Jackson, my first teacher, and he was the boy who had held the end of the tape measure when I measured his father's house in 1974 and spent three weeks measuring the house with him um, and it just seemed too nice an opportunity to miss so the, the idea of wind tower you know and I, I went back to see Anne in Bewley in Hampshire in the uh, in the in the summer and we walked along the Bewley river and talked about you know making this into a into another project and and looking at doing a comparative study of the original Bakash house against um, other houses so it's a project that goes back, you know, went back 40 years. It was very special. Um, and in fact, now we're doing a new edition of the book in paperback um, with, and in English and an Arabic version. And there are talk of other language versions as well um, to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the United Arab Emirates in December. Thank you, Peter. And I think the story of that little boy really does set the tone for the presentation. Uh, and that's been a great interview and sets as well for the next part of today's event, which is your presentation, Peter. And you'll be discussing Sharjah's architecture and the formation of its distinct identity and also its recent conservation projects. So I'm going to hand over to you to this and I'm really going to enjoy it. Over to you, Peter. All right, <laughs> uh, Sharjah punching above its weight. Um, I, it's not possible to cover all of in, in, a, in a quick presentation to cover all of Sharjah's historic architecture. So I thought I'd just really look at the last 50 years of it uh, and the influence that the ruler has had on the shaping the town, uh, Sheikh, uh, Dr. Sheikh Sultan bin Mohammed al Qasimi, and looking at what makes Sharjah different to Dubai in particular, and Abu Dhabi. Uh, its population is at 1.7 million, um, which is significantly more than the 7,500 in 1971. Uh, the majority live in Sharjah city, but as you can see from the little map at the, uh, at the top, we, Sharjah has enclaves on the east coast. It's the only emirate to have west coast and east coast uh, parts to it. Um, it has the third largest economy after Dubai and Abu Dhabi, and it provides 7.5% of the GDP of the UAE, but 48% of its industrial output. It was originally a typical fishing and pearling village along the coast. It was close, living close to the subsistence level. Um, it, there was fresh water and a sheltered creek available. Um, after 1814, it grew in importance being the seat of Sheikh Sultan bin Saka, the, uh, Sheikh Sultan I, when he moved from Ras al Khaima. It was first recorded in this drawing by Royal Navy surveyors of the British, British East India Company in 1820. And you can see a, a, a fortified wall and houses shown in red and houses shown in, in dark. And that's 
clearly that the, the red brick are masonry houses and the others would be Arish, which are the palm houses, which I mentioned. Um, in 1932, uh, the first airfield in, the, in this area was constructed uh, by Imperial Airways um, for the India route, the uh, London to India, Croydon to India route. Uh, it began operations in 1932 with an, a fortified guest house for overnight stops. Um, and it, this contributed immensely to Sharjah's regional importance and was very critical for its economic survival. Um, it also provided an opportunity for aerial photography, aerial photography of the town. And you can see that the town stretched along the creek very much the same as it did in that drawing of 1820. Uh, with a mix of masonry buildings immediately on the foreshore and a reef building stretching back into the desert. Halbro did a survey of the town in 1963, and I've done this superimposition of um, a contemporary aerial photograph with the 1822 plan um, superimposed over the 1963 survey. Um, and a view of the town taken in the 1950s. I'm not going to dwell on these, except to show then how in the 1960s Halcros began the master plan uh, to uh, modernize the town, link it to the other emirates uh, and creating a grid pattern which eventually would become the grid along which the city has been built. Uh, you can also see Al Mahatta um, to the left center which is the was the army base, the airfield became later became an army and air force base and the runway um, separate from the town. Um, despite modernization of the city, the ruler is a very active historian. He has a great love of the past and a concern for the welfare for his people. And from 1990 onwards, he determined that the historic core of the city must be retained. So unlike many other Gulf cities, um, the historic core um, hasn't survived entirely, hasn't survived unscathed, but large areas of it have and he's in, undertaken an extensive program of restoration and reconstruction, in particularly Al Hissan, the family house, um, and he's always tried to protect its historic heart. Uh, Al Hissan was built from 1823 onwards. Uh, the 45 buildings of Sharjah were demolished by the British um, in a, in a uh, battle in 1819 and they began constructing a fort to defend the town from the tribes on the on the inland side and its guns faced inland not towards the sea the sea was ruled by the british east india company and the the, the land was uh, obviously open territory and the, the, the british weren't so interested in that they just wanted to protect their trade in the gulf um, unfortunately the uh, it was demolished by the Gulf, uh, sorry, it was demolished by the municipality in, 18, in uh, 1968 to make way for this new high street, the main commercial street of the town. Um, the ruler was a student at the time in Cairo and he came back to try and prevent its demolition. But he did save one tower and he saved um, its doors and windows and all sorts of, sort of a bit architectural bits for, for it, which eventually he was able to reconstruct in the mid 1990s. It was rebuilt again in the center of this, this commercial street. And in one of my projects has been, was in fact to do a, re, a new restoration of the building um, some five or six years ago. Uh, the central of Blue Soup is very much, you can see his highness's own hand in this. Um, and he worked with, I found a drawing, a drawing of this in the, in the architectural review 1978. It was completed in 1978 and it's got these exuberant wind towers and, and blue vaults, um, lots of decoration, two parallel buildings. It's a very dramatic piece of urban townscape um, and a great landscape feature in the middle of the city. Um, very different character to the uh, shopping malls which now dominate uh, Dubai and Sharjah and Abu Dhabi. The wind towers, unfortunately, didn't work. They were uh, they were just ventilators in the roof. They didn't, they didn't do the things that wind towers need to do to be effective. Um, a parallel project, symmetrically placed across the uh, across the bridge, 
uh, of the main street that runs between them. Um, very recently, uh, a, a fish, meat and vegetable market was constructed to the you know, latest standards of, of hygiene and so on, right next to the, uh, a new fishing wharf where they, the fishermen literally come in and the fish are auctioned on the floor of the market every morning. And uh, um, they, that's, so that architecture continues being brought up to date. Um, Sharjah Airport was inaugurated in January 1977 for freight traffic um, uh, in, and for passengers in April 79. The architect was Edward, Edward Mansfield of Halcro, who worked with His Highness and the sketch is by His Highness. And it was altered and, and extended um, since 2009. And the central domed hall is uh, a, another contemporary landmark using a tradi traditional form. What I like about the airport, it's not vast like most, particularly Dubai airport. It's got a nice intimacy. It's very easy to use. Al Majara Souk, um, also by Edward Mansfield of Halcro, um, built in the 80s. Um, it was modelled on uh, the uh, Waterhouse's exuberant Natural History Museum. Um, and the rulers, again, he, he worked with Mansfield. His own his in, in inspiration, he told me, was a print of one of the gates into Istanbul that he that he had seen on the wall of his dentist. Um, so between, it's a sort of a blend of those influences. Um, and it's a for a souk, um, and it was specialised in clothing. Um, it was a very impressive building, but it was never a great economic success. And when I came back, my one of my first jobs that I had. As an, as in working as a, an architect in a private office, was to do the drawings for as consultants to convert this uh, the souk, which has many columns, a very grand central mall, but on either side little storerooms over the top of tiny little shops, and turn this into uh, what is today uh, Sharjah's Museum of Islamic Culture, and is a grand building, um, really is something, and uh, I. I got to experience firsthand how the ruler has a strong hand himself in, in the design. Um, the, it reopened in 2008. The King Faisal Mosque in Al Sur, um, close, to the, uh, uh, close to the Blue Souk, uh, was designed and built by the Saudis in the early 1980s. Um, it's got a very striking blend of traditional and contemporary forms. The architect was Abdul Rahman Abdul Hafid Al Junaidi of the Technical Office for Architectural Engineering Consultancy in Riyadh. The mosque was inaugurated in 1987 after two years of construction. Its, its two minarets are 70 meters high and the prayer hall accommodates 16,000 people. It's a very large space um, and as you can see, a very dramatic and it's a, a, a very nice blend of contemporary um, Islamic and, and uh, traditional Islamic forms. The uh, important government buildings around the city, such as the Chamber of Commerce and here the, um, the uh, uh, Sharjah Cultural Palace, and then there's the ruler's office also opposite that. They're in this particularly eclectic form of Islamic architecture, now you find these buildings, these government buildings and government related buildings on a lot of key intersections through the city, roundabouts and, and squares. Um, and they work very well at stitching the city together and giving it a, a strong identity. Um, a lot of them are by architectural and academic office. And very often there are sculptures um, and monuments in the space between uh, largely by Carlos Marinas, who again works personally with, with the ruler. Um, there's, that's almost a lecture in its own right, are, are the Sharjah's sculptures and monuments. Here's another one. This one's at University City. University City um, was inaugurated in uh, 1998 and literally it took one year to get it built, uh, its first phase, which was a huge achievement, get its students in. It's in two parts. Uh, I'm standing in the, this photograph in University City itself with the University of Sharjah 
uh, on my right, and I'm looking towards the American University in the distance. And the difference between them is that the University of Sharjah is uh, co-ed. Men and women are, are taught separately. So the central building splits the university into two symmetrical halves um, and everything is duplicated, male and female. Whereas at the American University, um, everything is uh, uh, co-ed. Uh, men and women are taught together. Um, and the ruler is very proud that I think 60% of the students at University City are now taught co-ed. But both both options are available for more conservative families and um, um, are more more and uh, more modern looking forward looking families. Um, the ruler tries to accommodate, you know, all of. He's very he's very socially sensitive in that way. Um, his response to Al Qaeda was to create the Al Qasimiyah uh, Islamic University in 2016, um, of very traditional forms. Um, again, a very dominating piece of streetscape. And of course, Sharjah's mosques located against many of our roundabouts and, and, and intersections. And this one is particularly beautiful um, by the creek, sort of the gateway to Sharjah, um, and is in memory of his late, late son, Sheikh Mohammed, um, and uh, built in 2002. Um, Al-Majaz Park, was a project that I interfered in with a little and proposed that the road, instead of following the creek, be rerouted um, around the back of a park and containing the, an existing mosque. And uh, while Al Masri, the Jordanian architect, um, it's also expanded a lot since then, but I put it in because it shows a lot of Sharjah and it's the, it has 25 kilometers of waterfront, which is a huge asset for a city. Um, and by rerouting the road like this, um, it, it put the park next to the water instead of separating the park from the water. Um, and it's done that successfully and the park continues to grow and develop. Uh, Kanas al Kasva, I have to put in because this is where the RIBA Gulf office is located. Um, and this was, uh, there's a canal linking two of Sharjah's lagoons. Um, and this building, the, there's two parallel rows of these buildings uh, and it's a very important social hub in the evenings and at weekends. Very, very popular with local families. I, what I should also say is that Sharjah is full of green spaces because the ruler is very aware that flat dwellers don't have gardens. His first degree was in horticulture in Cairo and he thinks everyone should have access to green. So those parks around the water uh, and in Sharjah are really important. Um, he sees that as very important for family and social life. Again, government buildings as landmarks. Um, the, uh, the most recent at the top, the Department of Information is very impressive, uh, but these buildings line the waterfront. So again, they sort of really define Sharjah's urban character. One of the last to be constructed is a new Sharjah Grand Mosque, um, Hassar architecture. It's very much based on uh, the architecture of Sinan, Mimar Sinan in Istanbul and Adini. Um, and uh, you, one can, it's very much an Ottoman style mosque. Um, I, I've, I've experienced Sinan's mosques in Istanbul and I, um, the, the decoration is is restrained. Um, not everything is covered in tile, decorative tiles, and I think it works really well. And it's also a very nice series of outside spaces, um, fountains and water features um, and places to relax. Another important urban landmark was the new uh, uh, municipality building, the Belladia in Sharjah, um, designed by Carlos Marinas and his son, Carlos of Art and Design Architects. Um, very Andalusian, uh, a big embracing buildings, widespread arms, um, a magnificent piece, <laughs> quite an extravagant piece of uh, urban form, but again, defining a very important square, Q8 square, and opposite is the uh, uh, another very important government building, the Consultative Council. So the, this, again, another public space framed by 
this particular architecture, which the ruler favours. So this is what, when I became architectural advisor 14 and a half years ago, um, particularly focusing on the historic heart of Sharjah. Um, and I'm a modernist architect. This is where this is the context in which I found myself. Um, and I particularly were initially focused on the historic heart. Um, this was the souk as it was um, in the, back in those days. Um, quite a hazard, um, very ramshackle, very run down, but a really exciting place. So you know, we did we we did some excavations, and um, the ruler wanted to enclose it. He thought that we would air condition it. Um, because all these shops were in private hands, I suggested it was going to be impossible to do that without emptying them. And the project that we did, which is this, the souk never shut for a day. We managed to roof it and ventilate it and uh, make it make it a much safer place. Uh, and this is how we did it. We built in a, a steel a steel roof structure with a reflective roof and uh, a ceiling and a reef ceiling, which is the same sort of material it would have had 150 years ago um, at the bottom, an airspace between completely open and ventilated and fans for the summer. And it works. You know, it, we're now in the midst of summer, literally now, and it works. The fan, all you need are the fans. And of course, you get air conditioned spillage from the shops. Um, this was taken before the, the souk was complete, when it was sort of half complete. Um, there was a big archaeological ex excavation in the centre of Bank Street. Um, we closed, nearly, nearly closed it, um, excavated and found, we were hoping to find some of 1820s Sharjah, but it didn't actually come this far. What we found was 1890s to 1910 Sharjah. Um, but we found the sea wall and we found the uh, uh, foundations of shops and lots of post holes of Arish buildings and tons and tons of shells. So um, this was a fish souk. There it is today. It's been reconstructed over its old foundations, including a small museum showing the some of the foundations and giving the and now relinking the souk back across Bank Street, which sort of cut the souk in two back in 1968. What I then really wanted to talk about here was promoting fine contemporary architecture and look at a selection of very recent buildings completed in the last 10 years, where Sharjah celebrates the contemporary and looks to the future with some architecture which I consider to be of high quality. Um, these show some of Sharjah's recent projects across the Emirate, not just in the city, continuing its focus on art, history, environment, education and learning. Um, the Arts Foundation uh, spaces were designed by Mona Al Musfi um, with Godwin Austin Johnson, and they follow the footprints of some of the old houses, um, which had been either poorly reconstructed or hadn't, uh, or put and or were very dilapidated, and they do it in a very contemporary way. Um, and it was an Aga Khan nominated project in 2019, unfortunately not successful. I think it's a real, these buildings offer a real model of how to develop the art of Sharjah and integrate contemporary architecture with, with the old. This is a more traditional way of doing it. This is the, Bed the Chedi Bait Hotel, Godwin Austin Johnson again, um, and this, these are a series of old houses that have been turned into a hotel. Um, a five star hotel, I might say, um, a series of really lovely spaces. So it's a very traditional experience, but also with some very contemporary innovation and, and, and contemporary interior design. Um, also integrating Sharjah's most beautiful wind tower um, on the Majlis of Beit Ibrahim on Midfa. Um, and I've, I've, I've got a photograph of that that I took in 1972. Um, I remember it, it's, and it's still a really beautiful winter. Um, it's now a coffee shop. Um, the Sharjah Museum's Authority building um, was a derelict building standing empty for years and years and years. 
the French Petroleum head, uh, company was ETPM, and uh, this was converted by Godwin Austin Johnson again into the, the headquarters for Charger Museums Authority. So it's now a very contemporary building. It lent itself very nicely to being extended in a, in a similar manner to the original building. Um, and as a piece of recycling, um, as a very sustainable solution. Uh, this is a, a little building, it's about 900 square meters, um, a building I designed myself, but under quite extreme circumstances. Um, Sharjah became, was awarded uh, capital of Islamic culture in 2014. And at the end of October, the previous year, uh, the ruler um, called a meeting at the uh, Desert Park with the Environmental Protected Areas Authority and myself and asked for an Islamic botanic garden to be constructed, to be opened on March the 1st uh, to celebrate. So we had four months in which to design and build a small complex, um, get an exhibition designed, the landscape gardens. Um, so it had to be, we immediately appointed consultants were sketching, I drew in pencil, consultants were quickly cadding and the contractors we consulted from the start and we decided that we would prefabricate half the building um, I'm using a German uh, cladding system and steel frame. But while that was being prefabricated, that half the building, which contained the wet services, the kitchen and the toilets and the offices that we would build traditionally. So the contractors were on site within four weeks of the ruler's instruction. And it didn't open on March the 1st, but it did open in March uh, 2014 on time as uh, a celebration of Sharjah. Uh, Islamic capital. Uh, a project that followed soon after um, by da Samaya Daba Architects, um, which uh, was started under my office and was completed by Sharu, uh, won the Middle East Architects Award Cultural Project 2016, and as an archaeology museum, an interpretive centre for the very rich archaeological area of Malaya. And these organic forms are really fit beautifully into the landscape and they're developed around a Bronze Age tomb which is uh, three and a half thousand years old, that circular tomb that you see looking down from the roof and these spectacular mountains which contain some of Sharjah's earliest archaeology going back 125,000 years. Sharjah has a very very rich archaeology and a very very active um, archaeology authority. Um, and at the same time, um, I was designing a um, account, uh, an education centre, mountain conservation centre uh, for uh, the breeding centre, which is part of the EPAA, the Environmental Authority, where we have brought the leopards back uh, from close to extinction. This is the Arabian leopard and the ruler wanted them to be on display at the foot of the mountains on the uh, east coast. Kalba um, and he wanted to put the leopards onto the onto the mountain uh, where they could be seen in their natural habitat um, as well as uh, a lot of other species um, and so this center was built uh, specifically to blend into this very spectacular dramatic landscape um, and to be as invisible as possible um, and from the outside what the what the visitor sees are some copper roofs and some copper cladding, which were, this area was the centre of copper production, which was exported to Mesopotamia and was part of the wealth on which the Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian urban revolution took place. Um, and uh, plastered, it's very simple plastered walls and paint to blend into the natural colours. And essentially it's a an air conditioned tube that, wends its way around the hill following the contours so it touches the ground lightly and with both external and internal viewing. That's the main entrance, so sort of discreetly tucked away. We were, it was very special in 2019 to get a phone call from the 
chairman of public works. I was standing inside a Palladian building in the Veneto. Um, and to be told that uh, ex-architects, a Sharjah firm of architects, had just won the Aga Khan Award, an Aga Khan Award for Architecture for the Wazit Wetlands Centre uh, in uh, the centre of Sharjah. It's right on the Ajman border. That's Ajman on the right. Uh, is it? Uh, where am I looking? Uh, I think it's Ajman on the right and Sharjah on the left. Uh, the border is immediately to the right of the photograph, just beyond those green trees. And this was a piece of wasteland that was uh, made, that was salvaged and made derelict, uh, uh, brought back from dereliction. Um, it was uh, very badly polluted, and but it is a natural wetland. It's where the wadis that come from the mountains, they sort of, they, the springs come out of the ground here. And you've got, because the sea is so close, you have uh, semi-saline conditions. And um, this is the wetlands is primarily for bird watchers and it is a, a migrant birds collect here. Um, and it was a, it's again, it's a building which disappears into the landscape. It's not look at me architecture, which is what you see a great deal of in the Gulf. This is a don't look at me architecture, look at the environment around me. Sharuk, uh, who were, um, instigated the Archaeology Museum at Malaya. They've also done this very beautiful little uh, butterfly pavilion uh, on Noor Island, which is one of the islands in the lagoon, um, close by the Majaz Park. And this was done by a German company, German architects, Three Deluxe. Um, it's a delightful little jewel box. Um, and uh, again, a very, another very popular family attraction. This is one of my favourite buildings in Sharjah and has been since I came. Uh, the Flying Saucer was a supermarket built in 1976 in the middle of a roundabout. The roundabout is long gone, is now a big traffic intersection and, and a flyover has, has been built since I've been here. Um, the, uh, it was a, a very interesting piece of uh, uh, brutalist architecture from the, from the uh, 70s very nice piece of architecture, which very recently has been uh, turned into gallery spaces by Manuel Musfi and her team again. Um, and it's a really nice recycling of, of an existing building and it has again, put a, a very nice meeting place, social place into the middle of the city. Um, and uh, one of the very nice Sharjah Art, Art Foundation spaces. She's also done the rain room, which hasn't been, which is not illustrated here. So when it doesn't rain here for a year, you can go and experience rain all, <laughs> all day. Uh, now follow a couple of projects that I've done with Hopkins Architects. Uh, this was opened last year uh, with Simon Fraser as the designer. Um, uh, uh, this is a geology park. Um, about 25 kilometres south of Malaya, in a very aggressive context, environmental context, very hot, um, and uh, a very interesting interpretation of the brief. Uh, and uh, it's the spherical forms are reminiscent of fossil echinoid sea urchins found in the sedimentary layers of the seabed that formed above exposures of the Earth's mantle. And the Earth's mantle here was, it's a very special place because we're seeing the Earth's mantle, which is normally deep beneath the ocean, being pushed up between two tectonic plates uh, about 90 million years ago. So the geology is not that old, but it's a place that people come and visit. Um, geologists, really, it's a very special place geologically in the, in the world. And much of the project is actually a path um, around going, th going through the geological landscape um, and the buildings are really just provide the interpretive centre. There are five precast concrete pods, each supported centrally to give a sense of touching the earth gently again, clad with copper coloured overlapping metal scales. They contain a field museum, provide a movie theatre, a museum's displays of rocks and fossils for school children and visitors to gain an understanding of how our central area landscape came to be as it is and explain its dramatic features and their importance. 
the interior of each pod is dramatically cavernous, suitable to the scale of the exhibit and, in, and centrally indirectly daylit. There's an, also an open air classroom immediately below the rock face and there are important Bronze Age tombs on the site, which provides a link between the geological time in millions of years and human archaeology in thousands of years. The second project, which literally was opened a couple of months ago, um, using a similar morphology, but in a very different context and in a very different way, is the Core Calva Mangroves Interpretive Centre, which also caters for the rehabilitation of turtles and uh, the care of turtles, um, and a link for people to understand the ecology, the very important ecology of the mangroves. Again, designed by Simon Fraser for the Chandra Environmental Protected Areas Authority, it provides education and visitors facilities to increase environmental awareness and engagement with conservation. Um, there are here, there are seven interconnected pods uh, and tensile structures which create a visitor centre with a terrace and panoramic views towards the mangroves. Um, the facilities include aquaria, exhibition areas, shops, uh, a shop, sorry, and a cafe. And the geometry of the pods is inspired again by the, not the fossil sea urchin, but by the, the fresh shells of sea urchins. Um, they are prefabricated concrete structures, um, which were able to be then brought on site uh, and erected on a central foundation. Again, and here I just wanted to really describe the, the, the importance of the outside spaces, a very intimate path through the mangroves and integrating you know, contemporary architecture into nature. Um, for the Sharjah Book Authority in Sharuk, Foster and Partners recently completed the House of Wisdom, celebrating Sharjah becoming uh, 2000 and, uh, 2020 World Capital of Books. The building is a library, um, of a library of the future. It provides social and study spaces, physical and virtually accessible books, uh, with print to order, book production, 3D printing and training, and reading areas and study pods in between a cafe and a coffee and a coffee shop. It has, um, it's a very elegant building with this huge cantilevered roof, which gives sort of 45 degree shade to all of its, its walls, which are then further protected by mushra beer, internally and externally. Um, for me, I, this is, I think, is one of the most stunning buildings recently constructed in Sharjah, and hats off to Fosters and to Sharuk, who commissioned the building for the Sharjah Book Authority. Um, the sculpture um, is important, is a, a scroll and a flame combined, uh, by Jerry Judah, um, a well-known British sculptor, uh, a sculptor and uh, so it's just again another. And this building is really well used. It when it when it's open, which is most of the day and evening, it's full of students. And particularly during COVID, when the American University campus has been shut, the students use this space. But it's a, a space where you can book a, a, a pod for a meeting. Um, you can go there for a coffee. You can have breakfast there but it is a library. Um, in 2019, I was very lucky to be able to go with the ruler for his presentation by Ben Derbyshire, president of the RIBA, with an honorary fellowship for his contribution to architecture, which I've tried to describe in this um, probably too long presentation, so forgive me. Um, um, I hope you will sort of now you will have a better understanding of of the ruler's contribution to um, architecture in Sharjah and his care for that architecture as part of the education and culture of the city. And finally, which really got nothing to do with anything that I've talked about, is a very important book has come out this week. I had still haven't seen a copy. Uh, it's on sale from the RIBA bookshop. Um, edited, by, edited by Sultan bin Sud al Qasimi and Todd Rice. Uh, Todd was also responsible for the recent book on John Harris in Dubai called Showpiece City, which is excellent. Uh, the building Sharjah is about the other side of modern Sharjah, which I didn't show in this, in this presentation, which is all the, the contemporary architecture of the 70s and 80s, um, which you know, took Sharjah out, out of being a traditional town into, into the city that it is today. So I'm really looking forward to getting, laying my hands on a copy myself.
So thank you. That's Peter, I think thank you goes to you. That was a marvellous presentation and you've certainly reminded us how we all must get back to Sharjah very soon, as soon as we're allowed to, to visit those most wonderful buildings. Uh, and also to share your passion and your experience previously. We've got lots and lots of questions and as usual, we are running out of time. But I want to make sure we get to at least two questions. So I'm going to start with a question from Mariam, uh, who put a question in quite early on. Uh, she says, do you think that the vernacular architecture of the region is lost or being remodernized with projects like the Futures Museum in Dubai? Will there be more new vernacular projects as identity centers? That's, that's a very interesting question and I've actually been uh, going out in Dubai for the new edition of Wintel and taking photographs of some of the contemporary uh, wind tower architecture that's being built sometimes 10 stories high, you know, along the creek and, and, and Jadaf. Um, and it's interesting, it's very difficult. You know, the vernacular architecture was built by masons and artists um, two, maybe three stories high sometimes, and it lent itself to that human scale. It's actually very difficult to adapt it to a larger scale. And I understand in terms of making a a local identity, um, trying to reuse all the elements. And I don't think it works. I'm sorry, Rashad, you know, he's done some, you know, he's tried very hard to keep this vernacular architecture alive. I think the way to do it is the way that Mona has done it with the Charger art spaces, where you keep, you keep that space, you keep that scale, and you use the traditional materials. You learn from that form, but you don't do it like a, a design guide you know it's it's got to be creative it requires inspired architects to make to to take the lessons of that vernacular architecture and use it anew so uh, it's very difficult it's easy to copy even copy and paste you know on the on the on your in your CAD program to ten make a, a two-story architecture into ten stories but I don't think you're going to make great architecture and I, I just think when I looked at the House of Wisdom, I look at Mona's art spaces um, that, and, and the Hopkins work and, and, you know, other, and the work that's going on in, uh, for Dubai Expo, the Grimshaw building, there is some really good architecture that's so relevant to this region. It's about sustainability, but it isn't, it isn't copying. Yeah, that's very true indeed. Um, and actually it leads to a very good question uh, about Sharjah's architecture itself, which seems to be quite distinctive, which we've seen in your presentation, uh, from the architecture in the other Emirates, uh, contemporary architecture. It seems to hold on to the culture of the region. Is this a calculated step that's being taken? Absolutely. I think if I wasn't here, I'm sure that those new museums would be in the same style. Um, the ruler was very brave taking me on. I don't think he knew what he was, quite what he was getting, letting himself in for. Um, <laughs> he loves he loves architecture, so I think you know he respects modern architecture. You know he's, I'm sure he loves the House of Wisdom. Um, the you know the architecture that you know, we've been involved in is is very appropriate to its place and its environment. I you know and you can see we've had a range of architects been creating that. Um, the traditional architecture and this, this special architecture of Sharjah, the government architecture of Sharjah, I think has been really important in creating this sense of Sharjah identity. Um, and it was certainly a very conscious move by the ruler. Um, it has not stopped him uh, sponsoring contemporary buildings. There's another one I could have shown. Um, it like immediately comes to, comes to mind as a planetarium, which is a very contemporary form. Um, and you know that so so he's not afraid of, mo of modernism he's not afraid of the contemporary but he made sure that there is a an islamic character to the city that can't just be, be easily erased and by the way he's located those buildings around the uh, the way those buildings have been located around public spaces and squares um, that is that's been really good um, that that helps reinforce that message. 
No. And I know we're running out of time. But I want to ask this question from Mike O'Malley S to close. And I'm sorry to the other audience that we can't get to all your questions. Mike actually asked a really good one to close today. Peter, there is a strong theme in your career thus far of being part of a new em new emerging countries and contributing to the architectural discourse in a sensitive way. What's next in the life of a young man such as yourself? <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to Michael and tell you that he's he's part of the ex architects team that won the yeah. Ar Argot Arn Award. Um, I I'm not I'm not sure what's next in my life. I'm very much enjoying what I'm doing. There's one nice circularity that has occurred that I spent 25 years in Africa and the main project for which I'm responsible now, but can't yet show you any pictures, is a Sharjah's new safari park. Um, and we have some very exciting architecture in there. Um, and uh, again, can both contextual and, uh, you know, it's a, it is literally, it's a huge park, it's a landscape project. So, you know, I, I started in Arabia with John Harris. I went to Africa, I spent a quarter of a century and more there. I came, came back to Arabia and now I'm finishing, you know, my my late career doing a uh, uh, an African project in Arabia. So there's uh, all these funny threads that give that make life fun. <laughs> Seems very apt indeed. Well, sadly, we've run out of time today. I thoroughly enjoyed the last hour and a bit. And unfortunately, we have to close the session. A huge thank you to you, Peter, for taking the time out of your, I know, your very, very busy schedule to join us today. And thank you for all your insight. It is an honour to have you as an RIBA fellow. It's obviously an honour for RIBA to have the ruler as our honorary fellow too. It's wonderful to have both of you uh, as part of RIBA community. It just remains me to us well to thank all of the audience today who joined us on your lunch break from within Gulf, as well as our audience from all over the world. Just a reminder, if you want to find out more about RIBA and its membership, please email the contact listed in the chat bar alongside with your email address and the team will be in touch. Until next time, for those in Gulf, have a lovely weekend. Take good care and stay safe, everyone. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you.